Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Jamie Fay with Fort Point Associates. I'm here this morning to talk about some of our experiences in uh, recent projects in Boston Harbor dealing with uh, coastal resiliency. Uh, Fort Point Associates is a planning, zoning, and environmental permitting firm. Works primarily with uh, private real estate developers and institutional clients, mostly in the Boston area, uh, taking them through the planning and zoning and MEPA review, NEPA review, uh, permitting at all levels, local, federal, and state. And so we basically help clients get their project from kind of a conceptual level to uh, when they can pull, pull a building permit. So this morning I'm going to talk about one project uh, that we've been working on recently in East Boston uh, with Lendlease. And actually, I'm kind of a sub here. Uh, Nick Islin uh, of Lendlease had a conflict and was out of town. So I'm going to try to walk you through um, a description of that project. And uh, they're a very exciting client. But I do want to mention, it was interesting hearing the uh, discussion by John Hancock. I worked in, 19, in uh, 2005 or so, I guess, on the Manulife headquarters in South Boston, which at that time was very cutting edge. Uh, before Manulife acquired John Hancock. And we thought we were doing like this really incredible forward thinking building. Of course, climate change wasn't even part of the discussion 10 years ago. Um, certainly, you know, uh, energy conservation and lead compliance and all that kind of stuff was very, very much in the forefront. But now you, you need to look at that building in terms of climate change. <laughs> That's in the floodplain now. Um, and uh, also, we actually worked on another project that you guys just acquired, Harborview in Charlestown, um, which is another waterfront project that will we'll have some of these issues. So interesting uh, to listen to that presentation. So let me, uh, let me try to go through this. Um, I'm going to start just a little bit of a description about Lendlease, because I, I've been in this business for 32 years. And um, I found that we have all kinds of clients. Some of them are uh, very focused on the bottom line and getting through as quickly as they can and, and moving on. Others have a much broader vision and are here for the longer term. And we're fortunate in the, this case that Lendlease really, you know, it's a global company. Some of you may know them in terms of Bovis Lendlease that had a big construction arm here a few years back. But they are definitely an international company with a, a very strong corporate philosophy. And uh, they try to develop large, complex projects by their scale. This clipper ship project is actually pretty small. Um, so it's, it's been fun and interesting to, to work with a client that actually has a real philosophy about development, uh, that they are extremely committed to doing the right thing from an environmental standpoint. They've taken on climate change. They understand it. They get it. They want to be responsive to it. And they've incorporated that thinking uh, into all their projects, which are mostly urban projects, but still really take into account a lot of environmental issues. And this is just kind of an example. Uh, I know you probably can't read all of them, but, but many, many factors that they look at in terms of planning their projects. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's very interesting that the vetting process that their projects go through at both a regional level, national level, and international level to make sure that this is a project that meets Lendlease criteria and that they're doing it the Lendlease way. So um, all these kind of sustainability issues have been considered in the development of this project. And um, it's really uh, it's pretty exciting to work with them and see how they have uh, responded to all these issues in, in a high level of detail. So I'm just going to talk to you about Clippership. Um, it's located in East Boston. Uh, I hope most of you have been to East Boston. It's really an exciting and up and coming part of the city. I've been working there since about 2000. I've worked on seven or eight projects with close to 3,000 housing units, most of which are either uh, under, most of which are under construction now. A few have been completed, and a few more to come in the, in the coming years. But it's going to be a really transformative area uh, with fantastic views of downtown Boston. Obviously, a very uh, strong relationship to Boston Harbor. Clippership Wharf is, you know, one of these projects that started in 1985 and never got going until Lendlease took it over. They um, really have moved it forward. They're under construction now. Uh, they have one of their buildings as condominiums. Uh, they've sold out 80 condominium units. They sold half of them the first weekend and the re remainder in the next uh, month or so. Um, but most of the project is, is rental housing. 
Uh, they are targeting lead platinum, uh, and then they will get there. This is, again, just sort of part of the corporate commitment uh, to, to lead. Um, tough site. You can see the relationship of this site to the waterfront. Um, there's the harbor right there, and, and uh, it's a couple of old wharves and piers, not a typical kind of abandoned industrial waterfront. Uh, but the, the edges of the harbor and the land have uh, decayed and degraded over time, as you can kind of see. And uh, so that presented kind of a challenge. The other challenge, obviously, was a very significant regulatory challenge. Um, those of you who work on the waterfront are familiar with Chapter 91. Uh, provides a lot of constraints about what you can and can't do. The city of Boston also had um, developed a lot of uh, municipal planning documents, harbor plans that uh, create uh, guidance about how the development should take place in terms of maintaining view quarters and access to adjacent properties and setbacks from the water. So very, very complex uh, regulatory process which we were able to help uh, lend lease get through and come forward with a project that uh, really I think they're, they're pretty excited about. But you can see again in this, in this photograph kind of how what you know, this, the harbor is sort of eating into the shoreline here and, and here and on this corner. And uh, this is the beginning of construction on the site. But it's, uh, you know, these older piers and wharves were built at an elevation that today, with, you know, the last foot of sea level rise over the last century, is now, you know, uh, kind of eroding away at the, at the shoreline. Uh, so one of the uh, Key features of this, in addition to its waterfront location, is the MBTA Blue Line Station is right there, almost adjacent to their site. So it's a very much a transit-oriented project, only you know one or two stops from downtown Boston, the financial district. So it's it's very accessible, um, and it's really attracting a lot of attention. They're really committed to you know zip cars and and bike sharing service. There's a water transportation dock right here on the corner. So there's also, you know, another, me another means of transportation, being able to take a water taxi pretty much anywhere in the harbor that you want. So these are all kind of contexts for the project. Um, the, the goal, and this is, uh, I would say, fairly recent photographic construction. They're, they're moved a little bit beyond that, but now in, in uh, foundation stage and starting to go above ground a little bit. Um, but the, uh, you know, the goal here, the, the challenge here was to try to create a place that's respectful, uh, create a solution that's respectful of its location, um, deal obviously with a very significant floodplain issue. The entire project's in the floodplain, coastal floodplain, um, and also try to anticipate uh, future sea level rise as, as part of the design. Um, and so this is kind of a new, uh, model, I guess, for waterfront development in which, you know, one has to elevate your first floor of your residential building significantly above the existing grade in order to account for sea level rise. And, you know, that creates a huge design challenge at the same time because, you know, in an urban location you want your streets to be active, you want your ground floor to be active from a public access and chapter 91 standpoint. They want all the activity happening along the harbor walk and at the ground level. Yet you have to put your residential buildings up. In this case, almost an entire story above grade. They were able to accommodate that in part because of the size of the site and being able to manage some of those transitions in pretty creative ways. And they um, retained Halverson design as their landscape architect. So it was a real key to making that kind of work so that uh, even though uh, the project is, is elevated significantly above existing grade. It doesn't feel like it is. Right, did, you have to, did you have to include uh, the Harbor Walk requirement as part of this project in East Boston? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It just There's a baseline. You don't get to do anything unless you do the Harbor Walk. So, yeah. And um, I'll show you a plan here. So the, the Harbor Walk uh, connects here to existing public way, wraps around the site comes through out around the building back here and connects back here. Um, actually, these buildings here are, are coming down and there's gonna be a view corridor going all the way back into the center of East Boston. It'll be about a half a mile view now to the water. Those buildings are gonna get taken down and a, and a uh, view corridor opened up. Um, the design of this project really has, uh, you can see the layout of the buildings. This whole center courtyard here is above a parking garage and is elevated 
uh, elevation 24. The surrounding streets are about 16, 17. So it's essentially a full story uh, above the surrounding area. And so that's made these transitions from the surrounding streets up to this plaza level a little bit challenging. But they really achieved that through um, some pretty terrific uh, landscape design. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So the, jump so in. The garage flood. The garage yeah. is uh, will flood if you don't put up the floodgates. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's definitely uh, the ground floor of the garage is is within the current floodplain. Yeah. So. Uh, but I'll show you the measures they put in place um, and talk about that in a minute. This, this is uh, what we're calling the living shoreline, which is an interesting part of the project. Normally you have to set your building backs from the edge of the water, um, which they did do here, the edge of the old seawall. But what we also uh, put forward as a concept, which uh, both the client loved and the public loved and the agency seemed to like, was to create this living shoreline in this area. So actually we drop, we, we you know, excavated out from Boston Harbor, excavated solid fill out, dropped the elevation down, and are creating really uh, this living shoreline consisting of intertidal flats and uh, salt marsh grasses and coastal banks in, the, in that area, which I'll show you in a minute, means at high tide, your building is actually right at the water's edge as opposed to 100 feet back. Um, so, uh, this is just, again, an elevation through the site. You can see this living shoreline area where we've actually dropped, uh, excavated down from the prevailing grade. Um, a lot of the public uses are on the ground floor with two-story heights, and um, those are essentially going to be able to be flood-proofed. Um, you know, the, the challenge in dealing with the regulations is your residential units have to be obviously above the 100-year flood level. In this case, we're, we're adding several feet of sea level rise in anticipation of that. So the residential units are set up very high. The commercial units, the restaurants and rowing club and parking facilities and things like that, you know, are less susceptible to flooding and more resilient in terms of being able to recover from that. So some of these units, like this is a restaurant on the end. It's a two-story structure. It's uh, floor level is a little bit above the parking garage, but not much. Um, it's anticipated that, you know, in a bad storm that may in fact flood out, but that's kind of okay. You know, you can recover from that. There's no, no great loss. Um, in this area, there's a rowing club, again, a two-story structure that uh, will have some flood proofing there, but if it floods, it's not the end of the world. Um, all, but all the systems and all the utilities in this building have been located at least on the first floor, if not on the roof so that the building, uh, while flood proofing is proposed, should it fail, the building is still functional and um, can recover very quickly from a flood event. And that's, I think that's the thing that um, we need to be thinking a lot about in, as we develop urban areas that we're, we're not going to give up on the city of Boston, we're not going to pull back from the water's mm -hmm. edge, but you know, the, the time to recovery is, is really a big issue in how you design and how you uh, structure your project. So if you can do it in a way, even if there is a big flood, if you can be back in business in a day or two days or three days, that's a big deal as opposed to some of the, you know, uh, situation in New York with, a, with a, the big storm down there where people are out of business for a month or two months or three months. Um, so this is a very resilient project and from that standpoint. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, so for a restaurant that's going to go into it, where you know it's, it's probably going to get flooded or there's a high risk. In, in, a, in a really big storm, yeah, right. in the I mean, is, is 200 years. In some sense that a restaurant are now sort of knowing how to gear up so that all their critical stuff is as high up as possible. But is, that, is, there, is there talk about that yet? So, you know, the way this, this uh, shows you, um, this, this is a, a rowing club, which is set up as a community kind of facility with a dock here, and people will be able to take kayaks out and go out in the harbor. You know, there's a, not a high level of finish for that, and, um, you know, if, if it did flood out, it, it, you know, it's a seasonal operation anyway. It, it, it can live with that if, if it has to. But there, this barrier system here is proposed, so, you know, there's... Uh, I don't know what you call it. You know, movable barriers, right? Barriers can put in in place in anticipation of a storm so it won't flood out. But I think, you know, if you're dealing with that kind of system, you always have to anticipate that it might not work, 
you know, somebody might not be there, it might happen, you might not have en enough notice. So I think you still have to make the assumption of the worst case, which is your barrier system fails. And this, it would be fine. Um, this is a restaurant down here, same situation, movable barriers available uh, to protect the restaurant. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it works, but in the worst case, if it fails, you know, there's no, no great deal of damage done and the restaurant could be back in business within, you know, a month or so. Um, these uh, other barriers are at the garage entry levels and those are obviously pretty critical. Um, you, you would rather not have your garage flood. Uh, it's full of cars. And, uh, but again, every, you know, from a building system standpoint, there's nothing in that garage that would um, preclude the building from continuing to operate if it did flood. Except for uh, my Mercedes. Except for your Mercedes. But, you know, again, the, the experience is that for most of these storms, you do have enough notice. And if you think it's going to be an issue, you can, you can get cars out. Um, but not everybody, you know, your Mercedes, you might be out on vacation. You know, you might be in Switzerland or something, and your car is still there. So um, the other uh, actually difficult issue from a uh, code standpoint is having e emergency egress at a level that's above the flood stage. So, um, you know, people, if, if you're in a flood situation, you want people to be able to leave and be on safe ground when they get out of the building. Not, there's no point in having an emergency egress from your building that's in four feet of water during a flood stage. So uh, these emergency egress locations were chosen specifically to allow people to get access into that upper plaza um, level in the, in the worst case situation. So this is kind of what the project's gonna look like. This is our living shoreline over here. We have a ramp for kayaks, a float and ramp for kayaks, very public waterfront, a lot of activity, uh, community rowing center in here, restaurant is over here on the, on the edge. And uh, just a few images of what the amenities of the building will be like. Pretty exciting location to be in, and they're getting a lot of interest. Uh, here's looking out over towards downtown Boston with a kind of amphitheater type uh, situation here on the waterfront. And a lot of community engagement involvement in the planning of the project. And this is, this is the living shoreline, which I'll go through some of the plans and then show you an example um, of where we are design, uh, construction wise. But the idea here also is to create a shoreline that is very resilient and adaptive to fu future sea level rise. You know, the choice the developer has on the waterfront is to create a hard edge um, to keep the land and the water separated. And in most cases, you're gonna have to, you know, increase that height in order to really keep future storms off, off the land side. In this case, we took the opposite approach was, let's let the water come in and out and have a soft shoreline with a lot of uh, vegetation, a lot of ecological benefit and uh, see how that works. So we started with the design here on the left and there's a series of slides and I'll show you the differences. Um, you know, this was the original vision that you actually create a little cove that you can come in and get on a float right in the middle, right outside the edge of the building. It um, turned out that uh, it was just way too expensive to do that. And um, it's, it's a little bit of a shock how much it costs to do the right thing sometimes. Uh, but in this case, uh, because of the fact that after this original design was done, they discovered that they had asbestos in the soil and anything they excavated on the site had to be taken off and at a very, very high cost. They had to do a redesign, said we can't afford to remove all the fill from the harbor because we've got to pay too much to get rid of it. So uh, we just kind of changed the elevation so that it's a little bit flatter and I'll take you through this series of slides. So that, this, this is uh, at a low tide situation. Uh, now this is kind of a uh, mid-tide level where, where the shoreline started, to, the tide's starting to come in. And these uh, white areas here are granite blocks being repurposed into walkway systems so that when somebody wants to come down here at mid-tide, you can walk down the ramp, pop onto a bunch of granite blocks and come out here and get out onto the seawall on the other side. It's kind of very, very exciting, interesting, interactive uh, place to be. Then at, at uh, a little bit higher level, uh, the whole area is flooded, and in these upper areas, uh, there'll be all salt marsh vegetation. Um, on a you know really high tide, the water comes all the way back up in this area, and uh, under a bridge in the harbor walk, and uh, back into this uh, 
uh, amphitheater area. So it, very much of a changing shoreline by doing this. Every time you go down there, it's going to look and appear a little bit different. Um, and so this is a couple photographs of uh, the living shoreline area here. You can see these uh, granite block seawalls that, that kind of segregate areas of elevation, which require different treatment in terms of planting. And um, that'll be uh, you know, a very, very exciting and interesting place to be. Um, so the, the project uh, also has incorporated a lot of uh, design features in the, in the public waterfront. Uh, you know, seating areas and benches, and uh, they want to create a very vibrant and active harbor walk area. Um, Can you go back to a couple of slides? Sure. Is there any concern with like the public being out when those flood? It looks like there's some points that are going to be dry during the high tide event, but you know, you could be potentially stuck. You talking about these? Home. Yes. Uh, how are you going to work with the public about that and deal with that situation? I'm sorry. Where the I, so just looking at your, how this is going to flood from low tide to high tide on it, yeah. you know, it looks like there's points that are going to be dry out there. Are you concerned about the public being stranded out there? Oh, stranded out there? Yeah. I mean, if somebody walks out here and the tide comes in? Yeah. Um, you know, they might get their feet wet as they walk back in. Um, but, you know, I, th I think, you know, it's, it's really, you know, people have, in the cities, people have this idea that you've got to separate people from the water and, you know, it's got to be safe and you've got to have barriers and all that kind of stuff. And, but when you get outside the city, people go climb on rocks on the waterfront and, you know, get wet and all that. Okay, I'm getting a high sign here to wrap up. So, <laughs> um, so let me just uh, flip through here. Uh, I just have a few slides left. One is just in terms of energy, we haven't really talked about it in terms of sustainability, but obviously they're, they're looking to do lead platinum here. So they're doing everything they can do to reduce energy costs. Um, and they are incorporating PV into the project, which will supply the power for basically all the common areas and commercial areas on the project. Um, you know, this is kind of their, their uh, summary. Um, you know, I think the key here is that uh, Lend-Lease is certainly from a corporate philosophy, somebody's really committed to resiliency and climate change and energy efficiency. Um, they have a long-term commitment. They intend to own the project for a long period of time. So they will, and because most of the project is rental, they will reap the benefit of the higher capital investment uh, in energy savings down the road, which is, uh, makes it a more uh, attractive for them. Um, they, they have not taken advantage, really, of any particular fin financing uh, to make these infrastructure improvements. Obviously, there's some financing available in terms of energy saving, but um, the big thing we've run against is that the you know, policy and codes just don't really encourage this. We've had to fight our way through, actually, zoning, building height, you know, where you met, you know, elevating your building. They don't give you any extra height, you know, under zoning if you elevate your building. And uh, so we've had to fight that very hard and find some creative solutions. A lot of the codes are just aren't set up for this. And uh, so it's, it's been a challenge. Um, this kind of solution probably only works on larger sites because if you're on a very small constrained site, putting, putting your first floor up essentially story above grade is, is a real design challenge in an urban location. Um, but I think, you know, they, uh, we've also run into, you may, any of you who have read the Climate Boston studies know that this area of East Boston is um, targeted by the city because there's a, a portal to flooding to the whole inside of East Boston that um, these projects, this one and others I've worked on, are all elevating their buildings and creating an opportunity to connect buildings and actually create a flood barrier. Um, but the city, you know, really is looking at that from a district-wide standpoint, and that's really the only way it can be done. An individual project can't solve the larger flooding issues, but, you know, if a community can get out ahead, certainly, um, as they're trying to do in East Boston, um, there can be some, uh, you know, benefit of, of looking at multiple projects together as part of your overall resiliency solution. So, um, so that's it.